black thing go from left to right, and I thought, I'm going to die out here. No one's ever going to know. I couldn't believe what my eyeballs were showing me. I'll never forget how evil the eyes were. It was horrible. I mean, I've never seen nothing that evil. It ran towards me at a, at a rate that I, I, I can't even explain. Turned and stared at me. And this look of, I just want to kill you. I want to say it was human, but it wasn't. He was, he, was, he was yelling at me to grab a gun, grab a gun. I was like, for what? He said, just grab a gun. And there's footprints all the way to the door of my house. It had went inside my garage all the way to the door. 911, what are you reporting? Jesus Christ, you better... Sir? Sure. Uh, Hello? Get somebody out here. What's going on now, sir? That son of a bitch is about six foot nine, I don't know. Do you see him now, sir? Yes, I'm looking right at him. Uh-oh. You're listening to Sasquatch Chronicles. Check us out online at sasquatchchronicles.com. If you've had an encounter, email me. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. Welcome to the show, everyone. Thanks for being here tonight. I know the holiday season has passed. It doesn't mean you can't still give gifts and uh, get yourself something nice. If you go to SasquatchChronicles.com, there's some new sweatshirts. I just got mine here uh, in the mail. Uh, Black sweatshirts, pullover hoodies, uh, also zip-up black sweatshirts. A lot of new cool items. If you get a chance, check it out on SasquatchChronicles.com. Click on the shop at the top. Uh, how's everyone doing tonight? Thanks so much for being here on a Sunday night. Got a great show planned for you tonight. Uh, Going to be speaking to uh, Blaine, who is uh, Doug Hychek's son. I think it was episode 312 uh, where I brought Doug on, the guy from Monster Quest, and he talked about his encounter out there at Snellgrove Lake. And Blaine was with him uh, during that the attack on the cabin. And after that incident, Blaine got really interested in looking for these creatures and so out in Minnesota, he started actually going out and looking for them. And it's it's an interesting thing. When you start looking for something, generally you find it. And he found it. He has very interesting encounters he'll be sharing with us tonight. I'll also be welcoming Preston to the show. Uh, Preston was out hunting in Arkansas and saw one of these creatures when he was up in his tree stand. Fascinating account. If you've had an encounter and you'd like to be on the show, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. And speaking of the website, you know, last on Friday night, um, I do additional shows throughout the week. If you go to sasquatchchronicles.com, um, I had Petra on the show, who's from, um, had an encounter out in Manitoba, Canada. Probably one of the best witnesses I've ever, I mean, it was one of those shows where I was just sitting there listening and, and there was pauses where I was like oh that's right I'm supposed to be asking questions um she is a uh, or was a vet tech and did some work for the government and after her encounter she went home wrote everything down what she saw uh probably one of the best descriptions I've ever actually you know what here I'll play a little clip for you from uh Friday's show take a listen and I got I think maybe about 6 or 800 feet away from the path that I had entered and I was basically on my hands and my knees throwing up. And again, I don't know if that's adrenaline. I don't know if the roaring that had happened had infrasound in, I have no clue. Or is it just sheer terror and fear? I don't know, but I was a mess. I, you know, and I, I got home and lived another day, but, um, you know, back to what I saw, I was able to grab some notes that I had made. um, And they're not at all in any kind of cohesive order. So I'll I'll try to explain what I saw. The one that I was looking at that I mistook as a bear was the same black bear kind of a color, except I noticed it seemed to have a little bit of 
red tinges here and there on its coat, but it was black, uh, except it had a little red in it. I don't know how to explain that, but that's how it appeared to me. Um, its overall body was huge. It seemed, if its height was eight feet, its shoulder width was four feet. It seemed twice as tall as it was wide, but that's huge. Like, to be that wide, it was huge wide. <laughs> the other thing that I've written down here is massive barrel chest. When it was at, on, when I was looking at it from the side, it's unlike anything. You could not mistake this as a human being. Like, it had this barrel chest that, uh, like a greyhound almost, a massive rib cage that stuck quite far out there. So um, that's the thing I had noted about about um, that one. And I also had put written down, because I got a fairly good look at its face, um, its lip, its upper lip is thin, but it's huge. Um, and also the distance between the bottom of its nose and the top of its upper lip is double than what us humans have. It, it's a very big distance between those two spots. I had noted that down. The other thing I had put down, its mouth is huge like a garbage pail. And what I think I was trying to refer to is, you know, a trash can where you step on the step on the um, pedal and this massive lid opens up. That's how the mouth appeared to me. And the other thing I put wrote down was that the the bottom jaw it's like a Roman helmet and I don't know exactly what I mean except when I, you see some of those old Roman helmets there's this massive big leather piece or whatever that kind of protects their jawline but its whole jaw looked like that it was just this huge um, I don't know this is big gaping jaw that was incredible and I want to thank again Petra for coming on the show. Uh, that was a very small clip from the show, but um, I mean, it. it uh, I was still thinking about it. Still thinking about it today. Uh, if you get a chance, check it out. SasquatchChronicles dot com. Uh, let's jump into it tonight. I want to welcome uh, Preston to the show. Preston, thanks for coming on. Hey, no problem, Wes. Thank you for having me. No, I really appreciate you being on. And uh, like I was telling you before we went on air, it's nothing more than a conversation, uh, nothing to be uh, nervous about. Right. Uh, you had an encounter while you were hunting. Uh, if you would, yes, sir. for the audience, maybe start from the beginning. Tell us what you were out doing and then kind of walk us into what happened. What did you see? Well, uh, like I said, I think it was, it had to be, at least the first or second week in November, um, back in 2013, uh, I, uh, it usually gets light about, uh, 730. Well, good enough to see, see around you. Um, I was in a, uh, 15 foot tree ladder stand, um, probably about, I don't want to, I want to say about 300 yards back behind my house. And, uh, the way my tree stand was facing, I was facing north um, on a logging road, and uh, I was down in a holler. There was a uh, there's a hill to my left, uh, and uh, kind of a culvert from the drainage from the road on our main road for, coming from my house, and uh, there was and then there's just kind of a wooded area off to my right. Um, I was sitting there and. It was just, it had just got daylight, so I'd say it was around 7.30, and um, the sun was coming up out of the east, and, uh, well, I had heard something coming down from behind me, and I heard uh, some snorting. Um, it was a doe. Um, I don't really think she could smell me. I think she kind of saw my, my orange vest or something I might have moved, and she was just snorting at me, trying to figure out what it was. She had sat there for about a minute or two, just snorting, and then ran past my ran past my left, my back left side, up that hill to the west. And uh, about a minute or two goes by, and here she comes running back. Man, 
think Goosebumps is even talking about it still, man. Um, it scared the daylights out of me, but she came running back. You know, I was like, sweet, there's probably a buck chasing her or something. And uh, so I was getting ready and just kind of getting my gun kind of in a better position. And she came running back towards a stand and stood underneath it, which I was like, well, that's kind of odd. I was pretty odd for I've never seen that happen. So I didn't think much of it. I was still waiting to see if, you know, a buck or something would pop out. And I saw something moving up on the hill, probably 50 yards away, 40 yards away, something like that. Um, it was close enough that I could see something. Um, and uh, this thing come walking out uh, down off the hill. And uh, the first thing I noticed is how it walked. And I didn't think it was a bear at all. Um, because I've seen bear on two feet, you know, nothing nothing like I'd ever seen uh, before. And uh, it was, was quite strange. The way the sun hit it, it lit it up pretty good from coming out of the east. When it When the sun hit it, it was more of a dark reddish color on it. I could tell that. I mean, I wasn't looking through my scope. I was, I was paralyzed. I mean, I, I couldn't move. I was, I was in shock and, uh, it took a couple more steps down the, down the mountain. And I noticed how it walked, which was, it kind of never really extended its knees. It just kind of like, I don't know, kind of did it like a little hop every time it walked, just kind of pushed itself off whenever um, extending its knees. And it was just walking and then it stopped. And I don't know if he saw my orange hunting vest or something, but I think it just stopped and stared at me for probably two seconds, three seconds, I don't know, and just kind of turned and walked down uh, the rest of the hill into that little ditch I was telling you about. And it was probably only three foot across. I mean, something could jump over it. Um, and he walked down to it and it's like a five foot drop down into the ditch from being washed out for years and years and years. Um, and so when he dropped down into there, he, what he did was he put his hand on the ground, um, when he jumped down in there, which was weird because, the way his arm bent, it wasn't like a human's, you know, um, it bent, it, it bent further up than a human's. Like its forearm was much longer, which the same with the knees, they weren't in the same spot as a, uh, humans would be, you know what I mean? Um, and then probably took two more steps and it was down further down in the holler where I couldn't see. And I mean, I'll tell you that only lasted probably, 20, 30 seconds, and it felt like a lifetime, man. I, it still kind of shakes me up. I think this is my really my second time ever telling you about any, this, and I mean, I told you, you were the first person to tell. Um, no, and, uh, and what did you do next? It was, I mean, after it left, um, I would imagine that shakes you up, especially being out there in the woods. You know, you, you hear and see everything. And here's something out of the ordinary. But what did you do next after it exited? Well, oh, well, I, I stood there, and you know, I'm not a bad shot. I mean, I can I can hit a running jackrabbit with a three dollar pistol. I mean, I, I'm not afraid to shoot. I was, you know, I've never been afraid at hunting. You know, um, my mentality usually everything out there is a little more scared than you, scared of you than you are of it. I mean, except for big cats or something. Um, but I was, I was petrified, man. I don't know how any other way to put it out. I froze and I probably sat there for 30 seconds trying to get, you know, get myself together. And I just, the only thing I grabbed was my gun. I had all, I had some grunt calls and some no bleats and just some other stuff, you know, my rattles. Um, and I had just grabbed my gun and I ran up to the house and I was, a senior in high school at the time and I ran back up home I I never I never stopped I mean I got tore up with briars and everything because I was just I was just going home 
I wasn't going to take the way I usually come in. I was, I was, I was done. I was not turning around. I was not, you know, taking time to walk some switchbacks up that, you know, hauler. I was just, I was just getting to the house where I felt safer. And I busted in the door, man. And my parents were sitting on the couch and I knew something was wrong with me, but you know, I didn't want to do that. You know, some, I didn't want to think, want them to think I was crazy, you know? Um, so I never, I never told them. I just told them I, I saw a bear, you know, I saw a bear. That's all I did. I saw a bear, but you know, I know I did not see a bear. Yeah, no, I um, understand. And a lot of hunters do was, that, you know, when they have an encounter like this, uh, they'll pass it off as a bear or they'll tell their other hunting buddies it's a bear. And then privately, when you start talking to them, they'll, they'll tell you it wasn't a bear. Um, I wanted to ask you, let's say the term Sasquatch and Bigfoot didn't exist for a moment and no one knew what that meant. And you were explaining to someone what you saw. How would you explain to them what you saw? Like a dad gum gorilla escaped from a zoo and was about, I don't even want to say how tall he was. I mean, he was broad, whatever it was, but I'd say it was, you know, a gorilla walking around out there. Um, I, I don't rightfully, you know, I'm not no expert on gorillas or anything. I'm from Arkansas. It, uh, but I'd, I'd have to say it was some kind of gorilla or, you know, something along those lines. Um, but I've never seen a gorilla like that. I mean, yeah, yeah, no, I'd I have to say it'd be a gorilla. Yeah, no, and I, and I understand. And, and, you know, with the way you describe where its elbow was and where its knee was, and, and that's the thing when you run into these things, uh, sometimes hunters will go, well, that's a guy. And then they get a closer look at it, and they're like, okay, that's not proportioned like a man. And then when they get a better look at it, they realize how big it is and how it's it's just not right. Something's not right. Were you able to get any facial expressions, or did you were you able to see its face? You know, it was weird. I mean, if you're sitting, you know, 50, 40 yards away from something and you look at it, I, I don't know. I'd have to say it was really weird because I just kind of focused in on it, man. And um, the way the light hit it, I could kind of make out some um, details. Um, it looked like it had, like it had a broken nose. Like someone had, you know, if you had a broken nose a hundred times, that's what the nose kind of looked like. Um, the eyes, I really couldn't tell you. Uh, for well, being honest, he never, I don't know, I didn't see any, I didn't see, he didn't growl or anything. Um, I did notice his head was more <sighs> like a football helmet, I guess I could put that way. Yeah, um, that's the easiest way for me to describe it. Um, I used to play football, so it, it was like a football helmet. It was, it was really rounded, I guess. Yeah, and some um, people describe him that way. A lot of times people describe him that way. I had a hunter on one time, Preston, and he was talking about uh, kind of a similar encounter to yours. Uh, and it all started out with the deer and the deer running back to his tree stand, and which is interesting because you and I both know deers don't run to your tree stand. They will avoid right. you like the plague. And having it run back to your tree stand almost makes you wonder if the deer is like, okay, this is a lesser of two evils. I'll run back to this and hope for the best. And But he described it like a football player wearing a football helmet, very round. Uh, sometimes people describe him as having smaller heads, kind of pointed heads. And then I've talked to a lot of witnesses that say, no, it was very round. It was a very round head, uh, like a football player with shoulder pads on. You know, when you see a football player with his shoulder pads on and the helmet on, you'll notice there's no neck. It just the head, helmet sits right on top of the shoulder pads. It looks like gives that appearance right. of no neck. Did you ever go back to that area? I did. I got my true stand and my calls and everything about. Oh, it was after deer season. Um, I think I guess it was probably a week before, or two weeks before uh, Christmas, because I actually decided to go hunt at my grandparents' place. Um, I don't know. I just felt like, um, I wouldn't see that kind of thing over at my grandparents' place. Um, it was, I did go back, but I never hunted there again. 
I would, I would never go. I really, I never really went anywhere without something, carrying something. But after that, I, I don't go a lot of places without a pistol, at least a pistol. Yeah. And after an encounter like this, you know, you always, there's always more questions than there is answers, isn't there? Oh, very much so. Um, I kind of thought of it like a mental, you know, I, I had a big problem with it and, um, I get kind of emotional talking about it because I don't, I just, I don't know what it was. I mean, I grew up thinking these things were just some hocus pocus, I guess. And, you know, I, after you see something, I guess your mind tells you that's not what you saw, but you know, I think my first reaction was like, it's a bear, but I, I know a bear and that was no bear, man. I mean, it scared the living daylights out of me. And I'm pretty sure I was, I was using a 270 hunt with, and I'm pretty positive if I even would have shot at the thing, I it would have done nothing besides, you know, take it off. Yeah. And you're probably right. And I, and I appreciate you sharing the encounter. I know it's not easy for you and I know it's not easy for you to even talk about it to this day. Uh, and it takes a lot of courage to come forward and talk about it. And hunters are a unique breed of people because um, I found in the past with a lot of hunters, they don't want to give up hunting and they don't really want to come to terms with what they saw. And so it either goes one of two ways. They'll either give up hunting or uh, they'll try and talk them out, talk themselves out of what they've seen and continue hunting in other areas. The problem is you can run into these things in other areas. Just because you saw it in this one area doesn't mean you're not going to see it in another area. Um, and I don't say I don't say I'm not saying that to be a dick or <laughs> you know what I mean. Try and fright, right, frighten right. you, but um, yeah. they are in other. I mean, you can run into them, and I think a lot of it depends on, especially when you're hunting. A lot of it depends on how you react to it. Uh, if you freak out you're probably in for a world of hurt. If you're cool about it, I think with these things, and this is just my theory, I could be completely way off on this. I think they're unsure of how to react to you. And I kind of look at it like human psychology, you know, guys in bar, you know, I've, I've dealt with a lot of guys in bars, that, you know, breaking up guys fighting and everything like that. And the one guy that doesn't freak out and he's not really reacting to anything that mentality used to make me the more nervous than anything else because I wasn't sure how that guy was going to react. The guy barking and uh, screaming and yelling and telling you how big and bad he is, that was the least of my my problems. You know, the guy telling you he's going to kill you, that was the least of my, my problems. I didn't even bat an eye at that. It was the guy that wasn't reacting that always made me nervous because I wasn't sure how he was going to react. And I think with these things... It, and maybe that's a bad analogy, so forgive me, uh, my hillbilly ways. But I kind of think it's the same thing. <laughs> I kind of think it's the same thing with these things. I think if you uh, don't really react, and you see that sometimes with people's encounters, when they're they're terrified inside, they're absolutely breaking down inside. But on the outside, we as humans do this strange thing to where we'll freeze. We don't run. We're not really reacting. But we're freaking out internally, but we're just standing our ground. It looks like we're standing our ground. And I think a lot of times when you do that, you know, he probably saw you and you didn't pop off a shot. You weren't screaming and yelling. And he figured, I'll just keep going this way. And and it's a very dangerous situation, I think, with these things when you run into them and they're hunting. And you get in between them and food, I think you can run into major, major problems and I think the way you reacted to it was probably the best way to react to it. A lot of people probably would have popped off a shot or screamed and yelled or jumped down out of the tree stand and went full blast while it's still in view, you know, took off running. And I think that's the last thing you want to do in these situations. And again, that's just my theory. I could be all wet at the end of the day. You know what I mean? Right. Right. And I think you have a very good theory there. Um, you know, I, I, I grew up on hunting and, you know, I'm not going to shoot at anything. I don't know what it is, you know, because I don't want an accident to happen. Um, but it was, it was so weird, man. I don't even, you know, that deer that had kind of stood probably five foot from underneath my tree stand to my right. 
I don't even know what happened to her. I was just so focused on it that I just, I just toned everything out. I mean, it was just like, I don't even know how to explain it. Everything around me just kind of faded away when I was staring at it. Um, I didn't even hear her run off. And when I came down the tree, she wasn't there. So I don't, it was just, it was just a, it was a weird thing that happened. You know, <laughs> you know, I used to, I used to make fun of people like, you're just crazy, man. You're just crazy. Um, I, I can't say that no more. Cause if no, I'm, I'm just sure. as crazy as them. So, <laughs> well, you're not as crazy <laughs> as you think. And that's the other thing, you know, and, and I, I can completely relate to that, you know, having that mentality of this guy's nuts. These things don't exist. The, this guy's unsure of what he saw. He saw a bear. Um, and until you see one, you know, people aren't as crazy as a, more hunters see these things than you realize. I probably talked to more hunters off the air. I'd probably put police a second, but first is hunters off the air that don't want to come on the air and they'll describe this and the exactly the encounter you described is a lot of what they'll describe to me uh, of what happened and they're not really sure what they and i'll ask them i'll say you know if if bigfoot and sasquatch weren't real let's say uh that term didn't exist no one knew what that meant what would you say you ran into 99 percent of the time the hunters will say it was a gorilla i would say it was some sort of odd gorilla I've never seen before, and that's what I saw. Um, even though it wasn't a gorilla, that's the only thing I could compare it to because, you know, we have nothing else to compare it to. Right. And then, you know, it's just it's the little things after this has all happened that just, you know, makes me question stuff more like, you know, I mean, this is kind of odd. You know, I can chalk this up to be something, but, you know, something else and what I, what it could be. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's hard to say. It's hard to say what they are. And you'll always have yeah. that, that doubt deep down. And I think that's our brain. That's our brain's way of protecting us. Uh, of always that self doubt of maybe I didn't see that. Maybe, you know what? Maybe I was just freaking out. Maybe I, and you eventually get past that point to where you realize this is what I saw. This is what I experienced. But there's always that, that moment of doubt that you always replay in the back of your mind of like, God, did I really see that? Am I going nuts? Uh, did I not sleep enough the night before? And you always have that. But at the end of the day, you'll realize that, yes, you did see it. Yes, they are real. And that's why I try and tell people on the show all the time. You can, and there's a lot of people who listen to this show that haven't seen one. Uh, they're just interested in the topic. And, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of people that laugh at me when I say this, but these things are real. You can run into them. They are out there, uh, and you need to be careful because you're you aren't the biggest baddest thing out there. You can carry your two seventy and carry whatever you want. You run into one of these things, and you realize really quick that gun may not save your life. Um, and, and prior to that, you feel like having that rifle. There's nothing you can't overcome in the forest, uh, but running into these things, you realize it's a huge obstacle, you know, running into them. Uh, I wanted to ask you how far away from you was this creature when you were up in your tree stand? Like I said, I think it was probably about, and I'm probably pushing it here, probably 50, 40 yards. And I think that might be a little, um, a little far than what it actually was. Um, it might've been a little closer. I mean, it's kind of hard to say when he kind of, when he's walking down a hill, but, um, I mean, I'd, I'd have to say, um, from where I initially saw him was, um, probably sh straight off to my left. If you drew a straight line, that's, that's about where I first saw him. And then where the last time I saw the, his shoulders and his head was probably, um, a little off to my left, looking straight out in front of me. Um, so he kind of made it. He was walking straight down and then kind of when he stopped, he took, he stopped and then took, um, just took a kind of a slight left turn and just kept going. Um, so, I mean, probably at one point, maybe, maybe 30 yards. Yeah. But I, when I initially saw him, it was probably 40 or 50, but, uh, I don't, I don't care to ever see one 
him or that thing um, that close again. Um, I guess I've heard people say, um, you know, I, like I told you, I'm pretty new to your show. And I was trying, I'm trying to go in order of, you know, listen to all the podcasts, but I've heard um, some people say about the um, Patterson film, I guess, um, that the breast and everything. Um, and I've seen that video and I can, you can, I guess you could see some br- uh, the breast on it, but I never saw anything like that. Um, I didn't see any genitalia or anything, so I'm going to assume it was a man. I wasn't really looking for it, but, you know, um, he got probably 30 yards, at at the most 35 yards, I guess, from me. How did it compare to the Patterson-Gimlin film compared to what you saw? Um, the, move, the movement was a little was about the same i guess um really i mean just the walking was probably the walking's what stuck out and i think that's the best thing i compared it to to the patterson film um but uh i nothing really anything else um i haven't really studied that film so i couldn't really tell you i've just seen it once or twice no i understand Yeah, and there's different types of these creatures, too. You know, a lot of times people have different descriptions, and uh, they'll say, hey, what I saw wasn't like the Patterson-Gimlin film, and some people will say, that's exactly what I saw. Um, So I truly believe there's different types of these things. Uh, But I really appreciate you taking the time to come on the show and share the encounter, because I know it's not the easiest thing in the world. Everyone thinks it's so easy to come on the air and tell their encounter and, you know, entertain me. Uh, but people who come on, who these are real experiences that they've had, it's not so easy to come on the air and talk about it. And I try and make it as comfortable as possible to come on the air and talk about it. But I know deep down it's not comfortable for people to come on the air and talk about it. And I really do appreciate you taking the time to uh, to come on the show and share it, man. Thank you very much. Hey, I, I appreciate you having me on, man. It felt uh, it felt really it felt like a a big uh, weight lifted off my shoulders finally uh, the day before yesterday when I got to talk to you. Um, actually telling somebody really helped, man, and I really, I really appreciate it. Um, it helped me out a lot, and I'm, and I'm, I'm most definitely sure that you have helped a lot of people by just letting them tell you their story without, you know, telling them you're, they're crazy. And I, I really appreciate it, man. Yeah, well, you're not crazy, and I'm honored that you'd come on. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you, Wes. Well, I want to welcome uh, Russell to the show. Russell, how are you? I'm doing great, Wes. Thanks. No, I appreciate you coming on, and I know you run the International Bigfoot Conference. I went to it last year, had a great time. Uh, but if you would, for the audience, talk a little bit about the International Bigfoot Conference and uh, when is it coming up? How can people buy tickets? And uh, give us all the uh, info on it. You bet. Um, this year on September 1st through 3rd, which is Labor Day weekend, in Kennewick, Washington, we're having the International Bigfoot Conference. It's uh, going to be a great stage full of uh, some of the top speakers that are bringing evidence that is the latest and greatest uh, most current version of what we're research is bringing to the table. So that's going to be really nice to see. We had uh, last year was our uh, first year and it was great to have you there. It was, it was a lot of fun. Uh, learned a lot from last year. This year is going to be a much smoother conference with a little bit more of a break between our speakers and such. But if, if uh, people wanted to get tickets or to have a view of what the speakers were um, look at over some pictures that we had from last year's conference, that sort of thing. It's uh, all one word. It's internationalbigfootconference.com. And on that site, there is a tab that says ticket info, um, contact info. If you wanted to be a vendor and have a vendor table at the conference, that's available. You can purchase vendor um, tickets online or vendor booths online. You can also get your tickets for uh, kids and adults. And the one thing I, the only thing that I would really like to say is last year we had just a few kids, maybe eight, 10 kids. And this year we're really, we have some great 
things for the kids to do when they get there. So don't think that this is just an all adult grown up facility with um, speakers and no activities for the children. Bring your kids. It's going to be a blast for them as well. Yeah, and I had a lot of fun last year. If you go to the internationalbigfootconference.com, I definitely recommend getting your tickets now. I know it was pretty packed last year, and I know you're looking to open it up and and have more people there. And it was a great venue. I mean, it's a beautiful place. Uh, The hotel is beautiful. The conference center, I mean, it's just a great venue. Uh, And I really had a great time last year. It was a lot of fun to uh, listen to some of the presentations and, and actually watch some of the presentations and uh, I know uh, I've been uh, Russell and I've been talking uh, about getting some poker matches going and and just making it fun, you know. Make, you can't take life too oh, yeah. seriously, you know, in in this life. And uh, it's it's a lot of fun to talk to all the researchers you people have heard on the show. You get to meet them in person and and talk with them. And um, I had a blast last year. I really did. I, I Woody and I both had a great time last year. And I highly recommend it. So if uh, the audience out there, if they go to the internationalbigfootconference.com, definitely order your tickets. We'll be out there. Uh, I'd love to meet some of the the listeners, too, as well. Anything else you want to tell us about it, Russell? Yeah, actually, I I think it's um, – you and I have talked a little bit going back and forth about maybe having uh, on Friday evening having uh, a little bit of space designated to have – some cards on the table and play with poker chips and, and not really a cash poker game, but a couple of door prizes to give away for, you know, some of the, the players that actually want to come and have a good time and enjoy a, a hand of poker with you. But this year actually is the 50 year anniversary of the Patterson Gimlin film that was filmed in 1967. So that's kind of our theme this year is 50 years of questions, three days of answers, the Patterson Gimlin film, so a lot of the speakers are discussing the coverage of uh, their their theories, their findings, their evidence on that film from 50 years ago. So it'll be a lot of discussion going on. One of our special guests will be Bob Gimlin himself. He's not going to take the stage as a speaker, but he will be there to meet people. And, and you can present your questions to him, you know, face to face and talk to him. What a, what a really neat guy and a great opportunity to meet somebody, an icon that's been such a large part of the Bigfoot world since 1967. Yeah. And Bob's a very approachable guy. He's a very nice man. Uh, I've met him on, on numerous occasions and he really is a very kind man and, and very approachable and I'm looking forward to it. So it's uh, September 1st through the 3rd. And again, go to the International Bigfoot Conference and uh, get your tickets. Russell, I appreciate it again. Wes, thanks for having me. You have a great day. The InternationalBigfootConference.com. Definitely check it out. Had a great time last year. And, uh, you know, it'll be mainly Bigfoot stuff. But if you want to lose in a game of Texas Hold'em, come on out. And uh, I'm I'm willing to uh, oblige you. (laughs) <laughs> let's jump to our final guest i want to welcome uh blaine to the show and you guys might remember blaine from the monster quest episode again i think it was episode 312 the snow grove lake uh, if you guys go back and listen to that episode i had his father on and uh, blaine was there when it happened uh blaine welcome to the show thanks so much for being here sure sure glad to be here and Blaine, you know, I don't really, I don't think we should go over the, the Snellgrove Lake incident. I think most people can go back and listen to episode 312. Uh, but you were, gosh, a kid at the time, and you had the rock thrown at your head uh, out there at the Snellgrove Lake incident during that Monster Quest episode. I wanted to ask you, I know prior to that incident, uh, you didn't really buy into this whole Bigfoot thing. I know you kind of kind enough to listen to your dad's stories and but I know from talking to you that you really didn't buy into the Bigfoot thing. Uh, that night that you had the rock thrown at your head, and most people listening know what I'm talking about on that Monster Quest episode uh, where the cabin was attacked. How did that change your outlook on this whole subject that night? It was like, you know, I went I went from one extreme to the complete other. And it's kind of affected my life. I didn't know it would affect it so much. It, it wasn't until years later where I kind of got a little older and it really started bothering me. 
like it just it really bothered me um i know at some point monster quest got canceled and and finding bigfoot came out and you know i i uh, occasionally would go on to the bfro and look at reports and uh yeah, it just it just really is stuck in the back of my mind. I told people, you know, friends that I had in high school and and all throughout high school, you know, occasionally and and uh, you know, as I got out of school, I would tell people occasionally. Of course, uh, no one believes you, and that's that's kind of something that you know really bothered me. I think, yeah, it uh, does. definitely as I got older. So, so what kind of happens is you, you start to like want to find some sort of closure you know you want to find some answers and that's the one thing you hear most from witnesses <clears throat> and you and i both have experienced it where uh, you have something like this happen and you tell people and uh you know it's oh come on you know were you guys out there drinking were you guys out there uh, but it's a unique place that snow grove place is a very unique place because uh, you know there's not a neighbor nearby that could come and huff a rock at you uh, you're literally in the middle of nowhere, and everyone in your group is there. And so, what else could it be? You know, bears don't throw rocks, um, and and bears don't huff pieces of of lumber towards a cabin. And uh, my heart went out to you. I remember watching that, and I know you were just a kid when that happened, and you could see it in your eyes during that Monster Quest episode. I, I think it, I don't remember if it was the first one or second one, but you could see it in your eyes. I mean, you were terrified when that rock came and, and hit the side of the cabin, uh, all the, actually everyone looked terrified. Uh, Dr. Meldrum, everyone in that group looked terrified, uh, when that happened and you started actually going out and, and looking for these creatures. Do you want to walk into your, your encounter when you, when you saw them? Uh, well, yeah, it's, it's kind of a, I kind of want to, uh, tell kind of how I got into it and, because cause snow grove is one thing, you know, being out in the middle of nowhere in Canada. But in Minnesota, you know, around the cities, there's there's a few really cool areas, um, forested areas. And I was kind of under the assumption at the given point in time that Bigfoot kind of only existed in, like, the farthest reaches of the north, you know, like in Canada, uh, northeastern Minnesota. But you, you do find in the reports on the BFRO that they they're not necessarily in the middle of nowhere. They're not, you know, in just the northern part of Minnesota. They're not just in the, you know, really, really heavily forested areas where there's no one around. You'll, you'll find reports really scattered around all over the place, some near towns, some near larger cities. In some cases, it's really strange, but uh, it wasn't intentional, but uh, it was me and my girlfriend at the time we wanted to go out somewhere creepy, you know, just go for a drive. And, and, uh, we had wanted to just kind of stargaze and hang out. But we found this, this kind of creepy park reserve. And it was like, you know, 40, 50 minutes away from where we were living at the time. And we drove out there and we found this kind of creepy dirt road and, and, and drove down. And I don't want to give the exact location, but, uh, I'll definitely tell the story. We drove down this road and ended up just kind of sitting there most of the night. We just basically were talking, just having fun, enjoying the night. And it just got progressively later and we're like, oh, you know, crap, it's like 2.30, we should probably go. And uh, on the way out, for whatever reason, I kind of wanted to see the area. It was the first time I'd been to that area. And I said, well, go left instead of go, you know, instead of going right, let's just kind of drive around and see. Because we didn't, we didn't know if we'd come back to that specific area. This is kind of the thing that started it all. We were driving down this, not major road, but it was, it's a well-traveled road, but it kind of cuts in between this just massive, massive park reserve. And we were driving about 50 miles an hour, I would say, and something ran in front of the car. It was on two legs. It was jet black, probably seven feet tall. I don't know. It was I mean, it was so, it happened so fast and I'm so glad that, uh, you know, I had a witness with me that saw it, you know, it was, it was my girlfriend that saw it as well. And the first thing I said was, what the heck was that? And she, she kind of looked at me and it's like, I don't know. This thing ran out in front of the car, 
down this ditch and like through this guy's backyard into the other side of the park reserve. It was just absolutely nuts. It was the weirdest thing. And of course, you know, we, we couldn't make out details. So it was like this big giant black mass that was running on two legs that just, you know, just ran super fast in front of our headlights. Uh, we talked about it on the way home, but a week went by, we didn't talk about it. And then finally we brought it up again. We're like, wait a minute. That was really strange. You know, it was like three in the morning. Uh, this thing was just running too fast to be a person. I just, I really don't think it was a person. And we had talked about it for, you know, quite some time. We're like, well, why don't we go back? Remember, I, you know, I had, I had been to Snowgrove. My dad's the producer of Monster Quest. I mean, that's, that's what he did for a number of years. He would go out and send uh, people out on these expeditions to look for strange cryptids. So it wasn't like a foreign concept to me to like, you know, go out and, and do, if you want to call it big for research, but I think it was more just like, we just wanted to know what was going on at this specific area. So we started going back there quite frequently. And what we would do is we would drive the car in. I think it was like early, early spring. So, um, Actually, it was more, it was probably May-ish, May 20th, May 30th. You know, it was, it was starting to get really pretty nice out. Um, but they had all the roads closed off in this park reserve. And so we'd have to park the car. And because the roads were just too messed up to actually drive on. And, and we've actually almost got stuck quite a few times trying to get back there. And so we'd park the car. And, and we usually get there a little bit, little bit later, like 6, 7 o'clock. And we, what we would do is we would hike down these roads and then we'd find like a cool trail and just go explore. And, uh, it was one of these times that we were doing this. Um, we were on our way out and it was starting to get dark and she was walking, you know, 60 feet in front of me and I was kind of walking behind her and we were just kind of taking in everything and looking around. And we had heard, obviously, obviously I knew a lot about, you know, these stick structures that people were finding. And, and so did she, and we had, we had kind of discussed this before and she kind of screams out to me and says, look, 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 look. And she, she points off into the woods and I'm much farther behind her at that point. And I instinctively just turn left. I don't know why I, I didn't even like really look where she was pointing. I mean, I just looked into the woods and I saw this large, grayish white upright animal it was very very quick super super quick and it took like it it was you know a couple feet in this kind of marshy it was it was it was in uh it was actually standing in some water and it was maybe 40 50 feet away from me i mean it was relatively close and it was there's a slight kind of drop and then like the train kind of turns into this really marshy area. And then there's some like really thick tree coverage. And this thing takes one step and goes into the trees. And the, you know, um, at that point she's running towards me cause I started freaking out then at that point as well. And, uh, she ran towards me and she could see all the trees still kind of moving and shaking. And, um, I just kind of described to her what I had seen. And she's like, Oh, uh, I was actually pointing to like the stick structure thing that I had seen. And uh, so the funny thing about it was I probably wouldn't have even seen what I had saw if she didn't like point to something totally unrelated, which is just kind of a weird coincidence. And it, again, it was, it was like a really quick sighting, but whatever was standing in this marshy area had to have been at least seven feet tall because I, you know, I'm, I'm five eleven, and we were on kind of the high ground. We were on this, this dirt trail or road. And this thing was taller than me. And it was down kind of a little drop off and actually standing in some marsh. So I really wish that I would have, you know, got to see more features and, and, uh, cause it, it was really interesting. And then they just kind of added this like really strange, it just, just, just made the area just seem that much more strange. Like, okay, at that point we're going, what's going on? 
You know, it was it was in a relatively short period of time that these two things had happened. Something had ran in front of our car, and then I had seen something take, you know, just a few steps into these trees and just disappear. But it wasn't, uh, just think about something that big and grayish white. I, I cannot think of any animal that would fit that description. Even though it was really quick, I just, I, I can't think, I can't imagine it would be a moose. It couldn't be a deer. It couldn't be a bear. I mean, it. It's just, there's just the, the whole thing was just really, really strange. Was it outlined more like a person when, when you saw it? Well, the one thing I remember more than anything was kind of like the back and what looked like shoulders. Um, and it was kind of hunched over. Uh, it wasn't, uh, it was built. It was built really, really big. So, no, I, I didn't get the impression of a person at all. And it had fur. You know, it was definitely fur that I was looking at. So, no, I mean, there's just no way it could have been a person. I mean, I was the first thing I thought was definitely animal of some sort. And uh, the only thing I can really think was it was something upright, possibly a Bigfoot. And what we ended up doing after I saw it was we sat there. We just kind of sat there on this dirt road, and it started getting darker and darker, and we just... Oh, we didn't really know, like, should we just keep watching this area? Is there going to be something that kind of comes out at some point? And nothing did. It just got just quiet. It was really, uh, really interesting. And so we we ended up leaving at that point and we walked out and got back to the car. And again, same thing. We kind of discussed what had happened and we're like, okay, we should go back. You know, we should keep going back. This is really, really strange. So that's, that's basically what we did is, but, but things got a little bit more interesting because, um, just me kind of knowing about Bigfoot for so many years, like I said, the game with my dad doing monster quests. And, uh, I kind of had this opinion that Bigfoots were mostly, uh, nocturnal. I mean, when I say mostly, I mean, I know there's a lot of sightings during the day, but I think, I think they really like to cover of darkness, or at least that's kind of what I assumed. Um, and again, both uh, both the sightings, one of them obviously was during the day, but it was getting late in the day, and the other one was at 3 in the morning. And we continued on with the hikes during the day, but we we didn't really see anything more. So we decided to start going there at night. You know, we'd, we'd find a really kind of cool, creepy spot, um, near where both these things had, had kind of happened and we would sit there and, and we'd sit in the car and we'd get out and we'd do a wood knock or two and, and we'd do some like weird sounds, something that, you know, we thought sounded cool and then we'd get back in the car and wait and we were consistently doing this and, and the first few times that we had went out there, there was absolutely nothing that happened. It was completely quiet. It was just, kind of, you know, it was still fun sitting out there, kind of not knowing what would happen. But things started to slowly take a turn. I remember, you know, we went out there one night and we did some wood knocks and we started getting responses back. Generally, they were far away at first, but then, you know, that just intrigued us even further. We're like, okay, um, that's strange. You know, we're getting wood knocks at, you know, 11, 12 at night. And, And remember, this isn't like, this isn't like, Canada where where you have a situation where people are really really far away so you can really rule that out we're in a place where people can get to people do go there at night I'm sure at times although it's it's a pretty nasty area because it's all it's all marshland and it's just full of mosquitoes like when we go hiking in there we have to wear full mesh netting because it's just brutal you literally get eaten alive if you don't have nets on your face. You don't have like, it it can be 80, 90 degrees and you need to have like gloves on your hands um, or some sort of protection because the mosquitoes and black black flies are just like, they're just relentless. But yeah, so we started going out more and and we started kind of getting these slow hints that something was going on. uh, We started getting wood knocks back and it, I was, I just kept thinking, I kept, I kept putting myself in the place of Snow Grove and I'm like, okay, well, you know, even at Snow Grove Lake, when we would go up there, it would usually be towards the end of the trip that they would start interacting with us in some way, shape or form. 
so we kind of hung in there and just kept doing this and we'd go out there and we'd do our wood knocks and eventually we'd start hearing what sounded like bipedal footsteps coming closer to the car. You know, we hear all these branches snapping and um, just really a lot of noise. So that's when we started thinking, well, what if this is a Sasquatch? What if there's something just kind of hanging around their car? And I, I kind of suspected that that might be the case, but there's really, there's really no way to know unless you, you know, you have a visual confirmation. Um, but I, I will say that it did sound, you know, you know, these sounds that we heard were, were distinctly bipedal, you know? So one of the things that we would do is we'd hear kind of some walking around and, and we'd have flashlights obviously, and, and we'd shine them into the woods, hoping to see what was making all this commotion. And what we'd find is, is the flashlight would just bounce off the leaves and you wouldn't really see anything. We knew there was something big back there. I mean, had to have been at least a large bear size, at least. I mean, deer are relatively quiet. It had to be something significant because, you know, big limbs are being snapped. And, but for whatever reason, every, every time we would shine our flashlights in the trees, the walking would stop. You know, we just really couldn't make out anything. So we were, we were kind of confused as to how to proceed. Like, okay, what do we do? We've been coming out here all the time. We haven't seen anything. That kind of continued for a while. We decided not to shine the flashlights so much in the woods every time we heard a stick break to, to hopefully, you know, get something to come closer. And we started doing things like bringing fruit out, things like that. And we would kind of set it out. And uh, the funny thing is, is pretty much never was the food touched. So it's kind of a fail, at least in that specific location. But uh, at one point, we started hearing this kind of walking and crashing. And we, we so whatever it was that was kind of hanging around our car started getting you know, more confident, started getting closer and closer and closer. And we would keep our windows down. And I remember my girlfriend at the time going, what is that smell? She, she had this, like, she kept getting this strange smell. And, and she had mentioned it to me. And she's like, is something burning? What is that? What's that? This smells really weird. And I had not smelled anything at that point. And eventually, I, you know, the wind kind of changed. And I smelled it. It was really, really bizarre. It was this really, um, it was, it was uh, you know, I, I had to kind of think back at all of these Bigfoot sightings, especially in Florida. I know they have a nickname for the Bigfoots down there. They call them the skunk ape. Skunk apes, obviously. Um, and the smell smelled very similar to what other people had described. It was kind of like a musty, smoky, sulfury, kind of like feces a little bit mixed in. It was super, super strong. It was, it was a very, very strong smell. It was like almost overwhelming at times, but it was, it was very unique. But yeah, so generally when we'd go, my girlfriend would drive or, or a lot of the time she would drive. And we're having all this really strange activity. We would hear wood knocks and uh, we would hear sometimes whoops and different things and just kind of strange things that kind of keep us going out there. Obviously the smell would always return when we kind of return to the same spot. And it wasn't until many months later, it was, uh, it was more towards the end of the year. I think, you know, this whole thing started in early spring and, it wasn't until, you know, late August, I think it happened, um, that she was sitting in the driver's seat. And this time it wasn't me that I'd seen something. It was her, which, you know, it's, it's, I'm just glad that uh, she had a sighting. I know that we saw something run in front of the car uh, initially, but uh, she didn't see what I had seen previously on the trail. And she was sitting in the driver's seat. And it was like a really moonlit night. So it was super bright. And she looks in her mirror, her driver's side mirror. And she freaks out. She just kind of like, 
you know, she kind of panics because she sees this like large face kind of hanging over this back of the car, staring at her through the mirror. And it really freaks her out. And the way she describes it, and I'm going to try to describe it for her, she describes kind of like this orangutan looking face. She said it was more orangutan. And I had asked her more, more so than like gorilla. And it had jet black eyes. And it had this kind of like auburn hair. And this auburn hair was like super kind of frizzy. And it, she said it kind of looked frazzled. It didn't look real clean or neat. But she did say the face was very humanish looking. It had, she said it had like a curious look on its face. It freaked her out. It freaked her out so much that she looked away from the mirror and she had told me what she had seen and she was kind of panicking and she looked back in the mirror and the thing had somehow disappeared. It, it either ran off, you know, or was still behind the car. And, you know, that, that kind of freaked me out too. Cause I was thinking, Oh man, what if we have to pee? And this thing's like right behind, you know, the, the, the rear of the car. And, uh, as far as that sighting, you know, I, I think, uh, we just kind of hung around in the car for you know a few hours longer and we ended up leaving uh, at some point. It was interesting because this whole time, I mean, that's, that was kind of our main goal is to see what was making all this noise, what was causing this kind of strange smell. And yeah, we were lucky enough to actually have some sort of sighting and, let me ask you, Blaine, were, were you worried at all? I mean, you know, years prior, you were in Canada. One of these things almost takes your head off with a rock. And it doesn't seem like they were super friendly. I mean, I wasn't there at Snowgrove, but from your dad and Monster Quest and, and seeing everything, it didn't seem like a warm welcome that you guys got from these things. And they seemed to be very aggressive with you guys. Um, did it worry you at all going out there? I mean, how did you get past the point of, I know curiosity kills a cat, but uh, did it worry you at all? I mean, was there ever a point where you're like, I'm out of here, man, we're done? Yeah, definitely curi curiosity drove us to keep going back out there. I mean, we just had to know. But what we would do, and we, we found that when we'd get really relaxed or stop paying attention, like, we hear all these branches snap and whatever was in the woods would, would seem to like want to get closer. So we kind of just lay there or not lay there, but we kind of sit in our chairs and close our eyes and relax. Cause, cause remember we would, we would work a lot, you know, the next night. So we'd be really tired. So we'd have to get some sort of sleep. And, uh, most of the activity would happen extremely late at night. So it would happen around, you know, two, three in the morning. It was kind of like the peak time we found, where whatever this was would come around. I'm assuming it was obviously what she had seen in the mirror. Um, but when we would sit back and, and kind of close our eyes and try to relax, that's exactly what I would think about. I would think about Snell Grove and that log being thrown at the cabin. I just kept thinking in my mind, I'm like, every day we would go out there. I'm like, is this the day where a giant rock is going to, you know, come hurtling through the window. Are we going to get like grabbed? We would actually, we would put our seatbelts on because we were scared that something would grab us and like rip us out of the window. I know it sounds weird, but it just gave us like that extra level of comfort. Not that a seatbelt would actually do anything. No, it doesn't uh, sound weird at all. Do. And so what happens next? Uh, do you guys see this thing? And then do you guys leave or do you guys stay there? Or? Yeah, we, we did end up staying there for... Uh, a significant amount of time afterwards, but yeah, we were, we, I mean, we were extremely scared and I mean, I'd, I'd be lying if I, I said we weren't, but again, we were really curious and our hearts were racing and we did end up leaving, you know, we kind of just left it at that. We didn't get outside the car. We didn't like go walking around the car. We didn't shine lights in the woods. We kind of just you know, decided, okay, let's just go. This is, you, know, you got to see something great. I think after that, my girlfriend, Maria, she, she didn't want to go out really so much anymore. 
So whatever she saw in the mirror was enough for her to go, okay, this is really freaking weird. Uh, I don't think I want to do this anymore. So, I mean, I, I, I don't blame her. Me, personally, I wasn't ready to, like, just give up. I, I really wanted to see... I wanted to see one up close, you know, in enough detail where I can make out some features. And that, that was kind of like the big thing that kind of haunted me, you know, with the whole snow globe thing. We, we heard all this. Uh, obviously, we had rocks thrown at us. Uh, we had that log thrown at the camera. We never actually, at least on that trip, I never got to see anything. I never got to see what was doing it. And that always really, really bothered me. So I wanted to see one of these things up close. Lucky enough, I was able to do that. Um, but it wasn't until many years after this, this whole kind of thing started up. And what happened was I, me, me, both me and Maria, again, my girlfriend at the time, um, we wanted to tell someone. So we had like an extra person to go out with. And so, so we ended up telling a guy that we worked with at the time. Um, she actually worked in the same building as me uh, at the time. And we, we told a coworker of ours and we kind of told him like, yeah, all this strange stuff is happening. Um, you should really come out with us. I think you'll be blown away. And I knew he had an open mind. And so that's exactly what happened. He, he would go out with us occasionally, actually quite a bit he would go out and he would be one of the rare, rare people that would actually go out and sit out with us until like, you know, three, four in the morning. I don't think there's a lot of people that would want to sit in this nasty swamp full of mosquitoes. And it was because the first time we brought him out there, he had heard these wood knocks, you know, like from three different directions and they got continuously closer and um, to the point where there was a wood knock not far from where we were standing. And so he was just like blown away. And so after Maria kind of was, she was kind of like done, like, you know, I don't want to do this anymore. I want to do some other stuff and that's fine, whatever. So me and my coworker, Jim, and he's actually a, a very good friend of mine. We kind of started going out by ourselves a lot. And we had found a new area, one that wasn't so bad as far as, I mean, it wasn't quite as marshy. So you just didn't get eaten alive by mosquitoes. And it was... It was a really neat area, and we kind of wanted to see, you know, is there the same kind of activity in other spots? And so we focused on this one area for quite some time, and we started getting results slowly again, just like just like the other area. And it turned into this big two-year deal. I mean, we ended up spending – It was we were on our third year of doing this stuff. And this, this whole time, we would hear stuff, you know, crashing through the brush. We would hear, like, strange whoops at times. We'd get stuff thrown at us, and we never actually would see what was doing it. Like, it would always manage to be there at night. And again, it sounds like we would just go out there and this stuff would happen. No, it was like it was like we'd go out there and we'd have to wait for hours and hours and hours. And we have to be extremely patient. And eventually, yeah, something something would kind of get some curiosity and would come check us out and interact with us for a short period of time. And we just never got fortunate enough to, you know, see it during the day, see what we see, uh, have a really good, clear daytime sighting. And that wasn't until, uh, I finally, it, it's really strange. Cause I, I, I think bringing a female with to do research, if you want to call it that, I think it, I think it makes a difference to a degree. I don't know if they feel more calm. I don't know if there's a sexual aspect to it. Um, if Bigfoot shares some DNA with humans, um, there may be some sort of sexual aspect to it. But it seems like whenever I would bring Maria with uh, to go out and kind of sit out at night and do these wood knocks and kind of see what would happen, we'd always seem to get a lot of really strange activity and this was a this is a really interesting night because this is you know this this whole two years nothing like this has happened and we're on our third year and it's it's early on in the year and we are parked in this little cul-de-sac area and we had just been kind of uh, out hiking through this park reserve and me and Jim had been going out there quite a bit and we we 
had, again, you know, the same kind of activity where we'd hear something crashing around through the bush. We'd get stuff thrown at us. We'd hear strange growls, things of that nature. So we, we kind of knew that there was something going on in the area. And Maria kind of joined me that specific night. And we did some hiking around and she kind of seemed like she wasn't very comfortable with being away from the car. And so I said, okay, well, let's go sit in, or at least sit, by the car so there's some sort of safety we're in this little turnaround area and the front the car is kind of facing downwards like kind of down a slight incline and we're we're surrounded by trees on the whole front half of the vehicle and there's there's trees behind us too but it's kind of a more kind of a dirt clearing where you can kind of sit and relax and you're not uh too close to the woods and we were out there until 2 30 in the morning and, and not a lot has happened. You know, we'd occasionally hear some branches snap and we were kind of like, okay, you know, it's weird, but uh, not, not a lot was really going on. And I had smelled a skunk, like an actual skunk, um, not a Bigfoot. Like it was just a regular old skunk. And it was getting late and I'm like, well, you know, I don't know if there's a skunk kind of running around here, but I don't want to get sprayed and it's getting late. Let's just sit in the car for a little bit. And we got in the car and immediately after, I mean, it wasn't two or three minutes after we got in the car, all of a sudden there's crashing on all three sides of the vehicle. I mean, just, just an insane amount of movement, sticks breaking, like just snapping, um, what sounds like bipedal footsteps, but just like this huge commotion. And we were both kind of like, what the heck? Like, we were freaked out. And so I told her just to kind of, you know, relax and let's see what happens. You know, let's just sit here. Our windows were rolled down. Um, not all the way. I think I ended up rolling them up a little bit just because it was, like, really freaky. Um, so we were kind of just sitting there, just uh, waiting to see what was going to happen. And again, you know, I know you brought up Snow Grove and that's exactly what I was thinking. Like, is this going to be like some big thing that happens or is something really crazy going to happen tonight? And we're sitting there and she started hearing a lot more commotion on her side. And my heart was pounding through my chest at this point. And she was really freaked out too. And so I kind of feel bad because this was like the first time that she had really came out and kind of stuck with it and really stayed out late, you know, since she had kind of stopped going out. And there's all this commotion on her side and then it kind of stops. And you could hear something urinating at like the front corner of the vehicle. So like off more on her side, but it was like this long stream. It was just loud urination. Wow. Yeah, it was, uh, she just like got totally freaked out by that. She's like, what the heck? And she was like squeezing my hand. And I was, I remember getting super annoyed because like I was scared too. Like my heart was pounding into my throat. And every time she would squeeze my hand really hard, it would just like make it that much more worse. You know, you're, you're jumpy. And this thing stops peeing. And I, I, I keep telling her, I'm like, just, just chill out. Let's just, you know, I, I really wanted to see one. That was like the big thing for me. I wanted to see one up close. And so we did. We kind of just sat there and we were relaxing. And um, it kind of got like eerie quiet, you know. There's, again, this thing stopped peeing and it got kind of more quiet, more tame. And um, we had both had our eyes closed. The, the idea was to kind of just hang out until the sun came up. Because we were hoping that when the sun came up, we would be able to actually make out what was like hanging around us. We didn't like the idea of, uh, actually, I don't even know if we had flashlights at the time, that specific night. Um, I didn't want to turn my headlights on and, and scare something away. I, I really wanted whatever it was out there to just be there when the sun came up. That was kind of my goal. And some people might think that's stupid. Um, I, I don't know. I thought it was a good idea and I'm glad we did it this way because it it did work out. So 
I remember we were sitting there in the darkness and it was, you know, getting closer to sunrise. I think it was like three thirty, four o'clock in the morning at this point in time. And she, uh, Maria just starts grabbing my hand, just squeezing it like super hard. I'm just thinking to myself, like, God, just stop. Like, I get it. There's, like, lots of weird stuff going on. But just... And she just keeps squeezing. She's like, there's one right outside the window. And I'm like, what? So I open my eyes, and I'm looking around, and I'm looking outside the window, and I'm kind of moving my head back and forth. And I'm like, I don't see anything. What are you talking about? And again, remember, it's still it's still pretty dark. There There is a lot of light pollution that night. So uh, it was... You could see somewhat, but it wasn't like super, super clear. And it is getting closer to sunrise at this point. And she's like, it's right there. Like it was, it was. And so all of a sudden my eyes focused and there was something hunched over. So it wasn't standing on, on two legs. It was on all fours, but you could see the silhouette of this thing. And it was rocking back and forth looking in my window and it was probably, you know, 20 feet away, 25 feet away. And I would like stare at it. I'm just like, what the heck? What is it doing? The other thing that's worth mentioning is at this time when all this stuff is going on and this thing standing out there, the, the same smell that we would smell at this other location was very prominent. Like you could smell it. It was that weird sulfur, smoky, musty kind of just really distinct smell it was like in the air. So basically I, I got her to calm down again. I'm like, there, you know, it's, it was, it was really weird, but we decided to just kind of, pretend like we were not pretend, but, but, uh, just kind of relax and close our eyes. And the idea was again, cause we were getting so close to the sun coming up that the sun would come up and we'd be able to like observe this thing, hopefully for a long period of time. And the sun started coming up. It was still very dark and you could hear some kind of sticks breaking and crashing. And there's this hill on my side of the car and it was this, not super steep hill, but it was kind of this rolling hill. It goes like six, seven feet up and there's lots of trees and foliage and coverage. And it started getting brighter. And I looked out my window to make sure that I could still see something and, and I could, you know, make out this, this shape. It looked like they were in just kind of the tree line, but it was still kind of too dark to really make anything out. But I'm like, yeah, I'm pretty sure they're still right there. And it ended up getting bright enough to the point where I could start making out facial features and I could see their eyes. And what was interesting as the sun came up, their eyes started glowing this really strange, not glowing. I shouldn't say glowing. They started reflecting like a, like a really strange bright neon green, similar to how a cat's eyes would reflect uh, if you were to shine a flashlight on them. And I kind of suspect it was because the sun was rising directly in front of where they were looking at us. So it was kind of this weird situation where you had the sun rising behind us and they were looking in our direction. And I think that was causing their eyes to kind of reflect this really neon color. But I'm not, I'm not hundred percent sure. It's just kind of like my working theory. So eventually it got bright enough to where I could start, seeing their eyes, seeing their brow ridge, seeing, you know, their, their fur. It was, it was like a dark black. And the, the first thing I was thinking was, holy crap, this thing is massive, like way bigger. Cause you, you, you picture something in your mind's eye and for whatever reason, it tends to be more human size. Like when you hear the branches snap, you kind of think of something like more human size. Go, I don't know why it is. At least, at least for me. And so, I, I just, I just remember like thinking like that is like the, the shoulder width was like double the size of my shoulder width, so it's it considerably bigger. And the arms were just super muscular. And the other thing I thought was very interesting was the fur seemed very clean. Like it, like the the fur had this kind of shine to it. And 
it wasn't I don't I guess I guess you kind of expect more of like a matted like just gnarly looking thing and that's just kind of wasn't really the case it was more it's more clean looking the other thing that's interesting is it wasn't standing up it was on all fours so you could see part of its like buttocks I guess you could say and then you could see kind of part of its back and it was not completely front on angle but it was a little bit off to the side and um you could make out like the top part of their arms, um, their biceps and so on, but there's a lot of tall grass right there. So I couldn't see if their hands were like, if they were sitting on their knuckles or um, how exactly their hands were, but I could make out a lot of their arms and I could make out, you know, obviously their facial features. And so I decided to get out of the car and just walk up as close as I could to get a better look. And I, I had to ask Maria, like, should I do this? I had to ask her like multiple times. And I think I was like waiting for her to say, no, I don't do it. But she never did. She's, she's kind of like, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Go walk up there, you know? And they were, they were obviously not as close as when it was dark and they were kind of swaying back, back and forth. And it wasn't, um, it wasn't just one, which is really interesting. There was two of them and they were side by side. And I walked, I got out of the car and walked closer to them. And I tried to get as much information as I could. I tried to look, you know, at their face mostly. I, I actually really couldn't stop looking at their eyes and their face and the, um, their head. And one of the main things that stuck out to me that I thought was really, really interesting. Um, and I don't know why I remember this so much. But the back of their head, they had like a, uh, I don't know if you want to call it like a tuft, but I have pretty short hair. But if I was to take my hand and kind of uh, push the hair up on the back of my head and create like this strange, like colic almost, like, almost like a colic. But they both had it and it looked, it just looked weird. It just looked weird. But that's, that's one thing I do remember a lot. And then the other thing that was interesting was their, their facial like I remembered seeing the Patterson footage quite a bit. And it, it looks like the Patterson footage, there's lots of hair on, on Patty's face. And these two things that were kind of hunched over staring at me were they, they didn't have a lot of hair on their face. Obviously they had like uh, hair on the side of their face, but like around their eyes um, and, like, and on their nose and, and where their mouth was, there was like really no hair. And it was kind of a smooth charcoal gray skin. And it didn't look, their skin didn't look very wrinkled. It looked more, I guess, I guess it wasn't really how I pictured them to look. And it was, it, it was creepy, but I think once I actually got out of the car and got the courage to walk up a little ways, and I didn't go too far, just because, I mean, the, the whole idea was, was super, I mean, the whole concept of walking up to a Bigfoot is not, uh, I don't know. It was just freaky. So yeah, I got a good look at him and I immediately turned around and said, let's do this. And when I was walking back, I didn't even hear it. I must've been so scared that I, I, like everything just kind of blanked out, but Maria could hear from the car, from her perspective. It was much harder to see anything from her perspective because she was on the far side. Like this tail was, was on my side of the car and I, I drove a Chrysler 300D and they have like these really low profile windows. And so it was kind of hard for her to see uh, directly up this little embankment, but she could hear all this commotion as I was walking back to the car, like six snapping. And, and when I got back in the car, they were, they basically had turned around and left as soon as I, I had turned around. So, um, yeah, that's, that's really it. I mean, that was kind of like the big moment where I'm like, Oh wow. Yeah. No kidding. I mean, uh, it takes a lot of balls to walk up on these things. It takes a lot of balls. I know guys have been doing this forever and, uh, the moment there's any sort of commotion or anything, they turn around and run. And I guess I can relate to that more than having the nuts to get out and walk towards them. Did they react at all when he got out and he started walking towards him? Uh, no, they, they had this really intense stare on their face. And 
like looking back, it's it's kind of a it kind of looked like a blank stare, a kind of just really flat mouth, really kind of like. Um, but no, they, they didn't really react. I think they were like they kind of seemed like somewhat curious. They were kind of like didn't didn't do a whole lot. It wasn't until I turned around that they decided to bolt off in the other direction. And why they stuck around for so long is kind of beyond me. I don't know why that is. I don't know if it was the female aspect. They may have been, uh, maybe it was a, maybe it was like a hormone type thing. Maybe it was a sexual thing. Cause it was interesting how the one peed on my girlfriend's side of the car. It does seem like some sort of sexual element or maybe it's a territorial thing, but I don't know, you know? Yeah, it's it's odd. And you know, the the thing is I think you change the game when you get up and you start walking towards them. I think you change the game. Uh it throws them off. They're not really sure how to react to that because they're probably not used to uh someone walking towards them. I'd imagine that was probably the first time they'd ever seen something like that. And I think in situations like that with Sasquatch, I think you change the game. It's like um I was just telling the the previous guest like in a bar and forgive me for my hillbilly way of explaining this, but uh, the guy in the bar, you know, I used to break up fights all the time and the guy barking at you the most and telling you how he's going to beat you up and kill you. And those guys never made me nervous. The guys that, that sat there and just stared me down. Those are the guys that made me nervous because you're not really sure how they're going to react. And I kind of think Sasquatch is the same way. You're not really freaking out. You're walking out to get a better look And I think it throws them off. They're not really sure how to react to that because you're not, uh, it's not really aggressive and it's not really, uh, you're not acting like you're terrified. And so they're not really sure what you're going to do. And so I understand the blank stare of them not really, I would imagine if you would have gotten closer, it probably would have been a different story. Uh, But for the audience listening, uh, can you describe the face, Blaine? You know, a lot of people haven't seen these things. And the the face always fascinates me because you'll get a different, I think there's different types of these creatures and you'll tend to get different descriptions a lot based on uh, regions of, especially in the United States, you'll get a different description like from Washington state than you will down in Texas or down in Florida. Uh, it's almost like they're talking about kind of the same creature, but the face is always different. Uh, but for the audience listening, uh, would you mind describing the face, what you saw? Imagine if Bigfoot yeah, and Sasquatch uh, didn't exist. You know, How would you describe it to someone, what you saw? Well, the face, um, imagine it, it, was, it was, I remember when I, when I saw them, I, I thought it was very gorilla-like in a lot of ways. So, I mean, picture gorilla. I don't want to say grill mixed with a human because that's too simple. I'm going to try to explain a little bit better. Um, imagine a gorilla with not such a pushed up nose, more of a flat nose, um, really big brow ridge, um, more of a kind of a flat human like face, but really not, well, pretty big lips, pretty wide, uh, big lips um like a grayish kind of charcoal skin tone as far as the it's kind of a hard thing to describe i mean it would probably be easier for me to draw than to try to describe to someone if this was my first reaction is i i thought dang these things look really gorilla like in a lot of ways and it, i don't know if it was the skin color or the maybe it was the fact that they were on all fours that made it so gorilla like to me. But I think the, the, the one thing I don't remember seeing, and I, I'm not sure why, I don't know if their hair covered it, but I don't remember seeing ears. And I don't know if that's a common thing. Um, but I guess it just went past me. That was like one of those things that um, either I didn't see because I wasn't paying attention or, you know, they weren't very visible. It's always interesting when you talk to witnesses, because sometimes they'll say it looked very human-like. And some of it might be our perspective when we, you know, I think as humans, we try to, I know there's a a scientific term for it, but we try to humanize animals. 
uh, whether it be gorillas or, you know, even a lot of people do it with their dogs. They try and humanize. Um, and so a lot of times we try and relate what we're seeing to us. Um, and that's interesting that you thought they were more gorilla-like. Did the expressions change at all on the face, or was it more or less just kind of a blank stare? Yeah, it was, it was really really flat-faced, really blank, blank stare. You know, they almost looked... Uh, it was intense, though, at the same time. It was, uh, but no, they, they didn't really change their expression much. But again, between the time, the because we were trying to just kind of relax and not stare in the direction too much, because the idea was the sun would come up eventually to the point where we could get a better uh, look at them. And, you know, it, it, as far as when I got out of the car and walked up to them and kind of stared at them, it happened very quick. But no, they didn't. They didn't growl. They didn't uh, bare any teeth. Um, they didn't act aggressive anyway. They didn't really change their facial expression. So, yeah, they they were pretty pretty uh, flat faced, I would say. But yeah, they they definitely reminded me of a you know, like a silverback gorilla more than anything. I mean, the way they were built, just like just crazy muscle, and obviously. Uh, Obviously, they look different than that, but I mean, it's just like their overall impression. I was like, "Dang, they, they look really gorilla." Like, I don't, I don't know why I got that impression, but I did. I just didn't expect it. I guess. How far away from you was the creatures when you walked? What was the closest point you were to them when you were looking at them when you got out of the car? I don't know, thirty, forty feet. Oh wow! So you were really close. Yeah, but keep in mind, there's a lot of. Uh, a lot of trees kind of in the way and there's a lot of long grass kind of covering their hands. And so like it was mostly the front part of their body that I could see very clear. And then I could see part of their back a little bit, you know, and, um, I couldn't really see their back legs very well. And so there was a lot of stuff kind of impairing, um, my vision and I was, my heart was racing. And, and so, but yeah, I did get reasonably close. And the funny thing is, is you know, I, I thought I'd be happy after I had a setting like that. And uh, all it's really done is just kind of made me want to go out more. Yeah, no, and I understand that. And I think that happens to most people. It seems like the more you get involved in this, uh, the more... And I get why you would go out. You know, I, I know a lot of people listening might hear the Snell Grove or remember that episode and think this guy's nuts. Uh, but it happens to all of us. Uh, you want to go back out. And even though at the time you say, I don't want to see him again, I think deep down a lot of people want to see him again. Uh, they want answers. They want to know what is this thing. Um, what happened next? Did you get in the car and you guys just leave? Yeah, after, after we heard all the commotion and they kind of took off one direction, um, we sat there and, and kind of discussed what had happened. And we're just like, well, we, we've never really had activity during the daytime like that. So I assumed that they had taken off and just went to do whatever they did. Um, and yeah, so, so, I mean, remember, I mean, it was like five thirty in the morning at this point, we had been up all night. We were just exhausted. All I could think about was just going home and going to sleep and, I was just deep, and after your adrenaline rushing for that long of a time, it was like an hour and a half, two hours that my heart was just pounding through my chest. So it's, it's a lot to like deal with, and then the adrenaline starts wearing off, and you just get really tired. You just like lethargic. Yeah, yeah. We we left and went to sleep. Let me ask you what what is your own personal opinion? What do you think Sasquatch is? What do you think that these creatures are? And there's no wrong answer, obviously. Uh, no one has one in their garage or studying. But uh, what is your own personal opinion? What do you think that these things are? I think they're flesh and blood. I think there's some really special characteristics about them. Uh, for example, when I saw them, I thought it was really interesting the color of their eyes and the way it reflected the sunlight. It just looks really unique. I think they may have some sort of special vision that allows them to see really good at night. I don't think... They're supernatural in a sense. I know a lot of people have kind of went down that path. And uh, I think they're flesh and blood. I think um, they may have some sort of what people would call super abilities. Um, 
obviously we know they have super strength, but I think they, they may have like a really great sense of smell. I think they, they probably have these things and that's what's kind of allowed them to stay hidden for so long. But one thing that bothers me, and I was telling you this, Wes, is um, it's 2017 and we haven't gotten better footage than the Paris and Gimlin film. And that, to me, that really bothers me because there's a lot of people out in the woods with really amazing equipment, really great telephoto lenses, and they have great blinds, and that's what they do. They, they sit out in the woods, and they, they film nature, and they film animals, and they film bears. And the fact that we haven't gotten that piece of footage just really bothers me. And sometimes I, I have to ask myself, is there some other weird phenomena kind of going on? Obviously, this, this, this physical tracks and physical evidence and hair and all this great stuff, but the fact that we haven't gotten good video is just really weird to me. And so hopefully we will soon. I tend to agree, and that's a part that bothers me. And and not only that, but you know we talked about it on the last show, the fact that they're reported everywhere. Uh, not only in the United States, you know, we think of, I think as Americans, sometimes we get small minded and thinking this is just going on here. Uh, but it's going on in Australia. It's going on in Asia. It's going on in Russia. It's going on in Canada. It's going on even in Mexico. I've gotten reports. Um, and there's really not, it, it's frustrating at times. Like you said, it's 2017. And why haven't we caught up with these things is, is beyond me. Um, did you guys ever go back to that area? Yeah. Yeah. We go back to there actually still to this day. Um, so far, I mean, that was, that was our third year in. And so this is, this is going to be our fifth year. So it's just starting to kind of warm up here in Minnesota. So yeah, we're going to continue, um, going back. It's, it's a lot of fun. Uh, it's a lot of work too, though. I mean, you have to be consistent. You have to keep going out every day or as much as you possibly can, um, and just like, I look back and I'm like, wow, I spent three years going out almost every night to get like this one night where we have all this crazy stuff happen. And I finally get a, a glimpse of them. And I'm just like, that is a lot of freaking work. Like, do I want to keep doing it? You know what I mean? Yeah, no, I know exactly what you mean. And I always tell people that, you know, a lot of people listen to the show and I know there's skeptics that listen to the show and I'm like, hey, go out there, go look, go look for yourself. Don't take witnesses uh, testimony as, you know, uh, the end all be all. Go out and look for yourself. Uh, the chances of running into them, like you said, I mean, you find an area and you start going out there. And you can't interact with them. What worries me with these things is you'll hear a lot of uh, witness encounters where these things tend to have very short tempers or tend to snap on you. Um, and, it, and it changes on a dime. Um, and I've had a lot of witnesses on the show where uh, situations to where they think they're the lovable creatures, all of a sudden one night everything changes and all of a sudden they're not the lovable creatures. You know, they tend to be very aggressive with people. Uh, not always, but, you know, in, in a lot of cases, that seems to be what happens. Um, I, I'm wondering if the area you're going into, they probably have seen you come in there every night, probably realized you guys weren't firing off guns. You guys probably aren't. There was really no threat with you guys. Um, and maybe that's why they were still checking you guys out when the sun came up. Have you looked around that area and and tried to see where you might catch them bedding down during the day? Yeah, yeah, we we found some interesting spots. Um, but you know what? It's uh, it's it's hard to say if if it was a you know Sasquatch or some other animal. We found some really cool stick structures that I could send pictures of. Now the truth is, I, I really don't know where they're sleeping or bedding down. We found suspicious areas, but I mean, we know deer bed down and they they kind of push grass down and. It's it's really hard to say. Like I'm not gonna be one of those people that says, "Oh, this is a you know big foot bat." Like I don't know. It's 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 hard for me to say. The truth is, I don't even know where they go during the day. I wish I did, because we go out during the day, and and uh, me and Jim do, and we we hike around all over. So there's just no sign that. Yeah, I mean, we'll find like cool stick structures and tree breaks and that kind of thing, but we'll have no interactions of any sort. We will. It's only at night 
or or get some sort of interaction. Um, and I always wondered that, like, where the heck do they go during the day? Maybe they just go where no one else goes. Maybe they go in, like, a really remote part, more remote than, you know, maybe it's a place surrounded by marsh where no one will ever get to. It's hard to say. It'd be nice to find answers on it, you know, and it's um, uh, that's a fascinating encounter, you know, and, and your descriptions are, are pretty close to what you hear other people say. The eye shine really fascinates me uh, because I've had other witnesses that have had these things on their property, as you and I were talking about uh, prior to us going on the air. And we were talking about how different light sources will create different colors uh, of their eyes. And it makes you wonder if that's the case, if that's really the case of, of the eye shine, why some people re- will report red eyes and some people will report green eyes. Some people will report more of amber eyes uh, that they see. And it makes you wonder if it's the light source coming in and, and hitting it, which is unique. Like you said, it's very unique because you don't find that with too many different animals. Um, generally, you'll get one color and it doesn't really matter what light you hit them with. Uh, if they have reflective eyes, you'll get that same color. And with these things, it gets reported different colors by different witnesses. So it really makes you wonder. I think they do come out at night, and I think that's when they mainly move around. I think that's when they feed. Um, not always, though. You know, you hear encounters that are broad daylight. Uh, people who are hiking run into them. And so it it really makes you it makes you think. Um, because it's not consistent, you know, it's not only at night and it's not only during the day, uh, with different witnesses. So it really makes you think about what they're doing and why they're out doing it. I know at night it would be easier to move around. It'd be easier to hunt at night, uh, in there, you know, if I were to put myself in their shoes, so to speak, uh, it would make more sense to be move around at night, especially being as large as they are. It'd make more sense to move around. It'd be safer to move around at night. Yeah, uh, I, I do think that uh, they are primarily nocturnal. I mean, I, I just think for something to stay hidden like this for so many years, I mean, this mystery is just dragged on and on and on. I, I do think that they're primarily nocturnal. I think they're, I mean, this is just my personal opinion, but uh, I think that's one of the reasons they're, you know, that uh, they've been so well hidden for so many years. And I just, really hope that someone gets some good video. And I want to point out too, that during the sighting, um, when I got out of the car, because some people are probably saying, well, why didn't you like whip out your phone and take a video? And that's one of the things um, I asked myself, but there's, there was two problems with the, that situation is we had been out there so long that my phone was dead. Like it just eventually died. I have an iPhone and it was dead. And the other thing is, you know, it was like this rare moment for me to actually like get a sighting. I like, I don't know. I guess I was more focused on the visual aspect, trying to uh, finally see one. I just totally forgot, you know, about a camera. You know, I, I suppose I could have maybe plugged my phone in on like a charger in the car and then turned it on and got the camera ready and like ran out there with it pointed at him. But who knows how that would have went? Might have went terrible. Yeah, no, and I understand that. And, you know, that's really the last thing on your mind when you come across these things. It really is a lot. I mean, and until you're in that position, it's hard for people to understand that. But uh, it's the last thing on your mind. You know, you're wanting to get a good visual and you're you're hoping your girlfriend says, no, don't go. Um, And, you know, she never says that. So I'm sure there was a lot of hesitation on your part to actually step out of the car. And I'm just glad that they were the whole situation was cool. You know, there was no, they didn't charge you. They didn't come after you. They didn't look at it as you being a threat. Uh, cause that could have gone bad really quick. Yeah. There's a few times where, uh, me and Jim would be out late at night in our little area where we like to go. Um, and we'd be maybe being a little obnoxious or something. And, and something would like, just bolt through the woods towards us and snap branches and like literally just it was almost like a bluff charge of some sort but it would always like stop before it came out of the woods and there was one time that I remember um, we heard this like blood curdling like 
gurgling, like, um, cough kind of noise while this thing was just bolting through the woods. And it was, it scared us enough to where we were like, yeah, we're done. We're, let's go, like, right now. It was really, really freaky. But overall, uh, overall, just doing this, going out all the time, was still pretty positive. Like, there hasn't been a ton of stuff where I look back and go, that that was really scary. Snellgrove was probably the most aggressive, just that big log being thrown, because that, that could be dangerous if it hit a window or something, um, or, you know, if it hit a person. But, um, yeah, nothing nothing really too aggressive has happened, at least with our research down, down here. Well, I appreciate you coming on and, and sharing your encounters and just taking the time to come on, Blaine. I really do appreciate you taking the time to come on the show, so thank you. Yeah, no problem. That was cool. It was fun. Uh, I'm glad you, you do Sasquatch Chronicles. It's, uh, it's really cool. I mean, some of the stories you, you have on and some eyewitnesses, it's just, it's just fun. It's, it's a really cool show, man. I appreciate it, man. Thank you again. And that's it for tonight, everyone. And remember, if you've had an encounter, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. Until next time, everyone. Yeah.